Now let's kind of switch pace a little bit and we'll talk about, I'll call the non-display part of the presentation, okay? So we're going to get into components and devices that didn't quite fit in the display headset. We started with headsets, then we talked about displays. Now we're going to talk about some other stuff. Talked about dimming and the need for electrochromic dimming. I'm very big on the ability to do electrochromic dimming where the uh, it's non-polarized. I really don't like the idea of requiring polarized light. We may remember Magic Leap had polarized dimming. They were doing uh, segmented polarized dimming. The problem with that is once you say polarized, if you have to polarize something, you tend to block about eight uh, over 60% of the light. As soon as you say polarized electrochromic dimming, you've got a polarizer in there. Most of these good, decent polarizers that are passed through are going to block about 60% of the light, at least 50%. And typically before you're done, it's about 60% of the light. So that that's a big, that's a huge first step to drop off. When you do this is a, when you do their um, something like this is a company flex enable, they're doing a non-polarized dimmer. Um, it's called a guest host technology. Basically, you mix it effectively. A dye is mixed in with the liquid crystal, and the liquid crystal controls the dye, and you can get a various ratios out of this. But basically, what it does is is that it it allows you to dim without dealing with polarization. So you you don't so the dimming is generally not as much as you could get with polarization cross polarizing with uh, that stuff can get very dark but you don't know maybe need dark when you're doing like AR glasses if you're doing AR glasses maybe you only want about a five to one darkening ratio so you don't need it to go really dark and so uh, when you do these electrochromic type dimmings I, I'm much prefer in something for AR glasses to be non-polarizing because the first step is not a 2x drop in dimming. So now you got something you could go from indoor to outdoor if it's shady or whatnot. You're not having to take it off or, or remove it or something just because uh, the the basic step. So uh, you don't get necessarily when you do that, you're going to concede that you're not going to get as dark. But you, do you really need as dark when you're doing see-through type stuff? So Anyway, they Flex Enable is one of the companies. One of the neat parts about Flex Enable too, their technology is done on a I think it's called triacetide sheet. But what they can do is they can actually curve it. That's where the flex comes from. They literally can conform this 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 uh, cell to the shape of a of of optics and stuff. So you can make it conform so it can curve bend and whatnot and, and it can convert conform in two dimensions they use a material that they can heat up to to where it gets soft but doesn't totally destroy it. It, it it gets soft to where it doesn't damage the liquid crystal and they can literally mold it into shape in in in, in two dir two directions which is something you can't say of all plastics many plastics many things you get that you can bend oftentimes you can only bend in one axis they can actually bend around around the spherical curve if they needed to. So that's Flex Enable. Another company that was at uh, presented at um, ARVRMR was a thing called Cambridge Mechatronics, and I've written about them a couple of times. It's kind of a fascinating technology, but it uses a shape memory alloy, which is a fancy name of saying uh, use a wire like you may know like a the old fashioned thermostats. You know how you heat them up and they bend. Well. This is like taking it to the scientific extreme, or what they do is they take a really small wire, um, a shape memory alloy wire, and as you heat it up a little bit, doesn't take very much heat, it'll stretch, it'll it'll stretch and return based on the temperature. Well, it turns out that that there's a as it stretches and returns, that wire will change its resistivity. So you can now use a feedback loop based on resistivity to control this wire extremely accurately. And they've demonstrated how they can use this to move lenses. Their current business is highly in, self, in the cell phone area where they're using it to control optics for, for camera lenses and so forth. But they're also looking now and one of their big pushes in the future is to look at using it for controlling optics for things like vertex accommodation conflict so we can move the optics and lenses. So you can imagine you'd have a little adopter or other adjustment optics that could move in and out based on that. But they're, it's pretty fascinating what they can do with these. It's just 
they they're basically they're a company in the business of designing these various structures using these these wires so they can move things in all kinds of direction like x y and z pitch the whole thing so anyway it's a different thing oh one of their other tech things that they've come up with lately is they have what they call zero hold power so they now have a way where they can do it where you don't have to apply you only apply power when you're moving the optics you don't have to keep applying power for example with the with the camera things they always have to apply a little bit of current to to keep it wherever it's positioned but they now have a thing called zero hold technology um where they could do it so they could um uh, move the thing and then not have to apply any more power so that's kind of hmm. how many uh, mundra they're um an interesting uh, uh or from wearable devices actually is the company but they they have a thing for reading your wrist. Basically, it's a thing that looks like something you'd wear on your watch, and they have these little electrodes. And what basically, what he's showing there is they're basically interpreting the whatever the electro signals that go down your wrist. They're able to figure out what your fingers are doing. And you've seen similar stuff from companies like um, uh, Meta has demonstrated this thing occasionally. But basically, they're one of the companies working on on how to do gesture control and stuff. Um, now, one thing I always say, and, and it's it's it means you don't have to have an extra controller in your hand or something, but it's still not to me quite hands free because you've now got to make deliberate gestures, and that's one thing I have a problem with even with the Apple Vision Pro that yeah they're looking at your fingers and all, but it you know there's something to be said for tactile feedback and for having buttons and things that that make things work. But still, anyway, they've they've developed uh, a, a, a technology, and they were at the AirVR MR, and they were showing uh, their thing. It does work, you know. You can you can figure out what the fingers are doing, but based on um, uh, the signals going down through your wrist. How I had a chance actually to interview the CEO Asher Dahan at the time, um, a couple years back, and uh, had a chance to see them at, see them at an AWE several years back as well. How how good did you think it was? I know that at the time they're talking about on the roadmap they're going to create this Apple Watch band form factor, which yep. is a, a nice improvement in the form factor overall. It really does look very much like a standard Apple Watch band at this point, which is incredible. How good was it when you got a chance to play with it? it worked. You know, I only it's like you're on a show floor. You have no training time, so it's really hard to come up with a really good thing. I, I say this about optics as well. It says you know when I do something on show floor, hey, I'm getting a demo. It's controlled. B, I'm not, I don't get enough experience to really know how to use it really well. I mean, it works. They let me try it. It worked. I could, I could, you know, you can pick things with it, but I don't know how good it would be in actual use. You really have to use it in anger. It's like uh, uh, one of my favorite quotes on the Apple Vision Pro is it's magical till it's not. That was actually originally from Addie Robertson, who writes for The Verge or is an editor at The Verge. Um, but you know it's magical till it's not. I don't know in this case because I haven't get to use it. Like you really have to use these things for extended periods of time to figure out where they work and where they don't. And the thing I find with the Apple Vision Pro is that gesture stuff is almost more frustrating. I'm I'm left wanting to find other selection devices which aren't available <laughs> uh, to control the Apple Vision Pro. So I don't know how well this works in the long haul. At yeah. least it doesn't require your hand to be in a specific place for it to see it and all that that's what i like about what wearable devices is doing or just this general class of input device is that you don't have to hold your hand up in the air in order to use it apple vision pro they did such a great job of trying to create that sort of experience with cameras by putting lots of cameras pointing lots of different directions so it can see your hand even when it's you know more casually by your side but i i think that anybody that i've chatted to that's in the input device business acknowledges that's got to be multimodal, that this by itself is not sufficient to handle all the input modalities that people need. Yeah, and we'll get into this a little bit later when we, if we talk about Apple is that, um, yeah, it, it, it's okay as a secondary, I call it a secondary input device. It's a little hard to look at this as your only input device. Here's one that did not work for me very well. <laughs> and and uh, I like to give, um, uh, com you know, this is a small company. They wanted to meet with me, Afferents. I didn't know anything about them, but we met with them. This is at CES, by the way. This is in their suite at CES. And what they're doing is they're trying to give the other side of it, give you feedback. 
So the idea here is that they can give you these gloves and they have little electrodes that are wrapped around each finger. And they give you a little electrical shock, so to speak, or a little bit of electrical stimulation to try to simulate touching things. And so when you're using it, and it could be that I didn't get a chance to, to try it very well, or I wasn't a very good student of it, or didn't have enough time to really learn it. But I found it a fairly uncomfortable experience, in my, <laughs> to be frank. It just, it, it, it works. I mean, yeah, you can tell things are happening, but it's just not a, it's not a, it's not the experience I think people are going to be real excited about using. I don't know. They claim they're working on getting it better and they'll, they'll feedback stuff and maybe it will work, but I felt a little bit more like it was trying to be a muscle stimulation machine more than a, 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 a haptic feedback device. I get why they want to do it. I mean, if you, if you went down to the CES show floor, God, you look at some of the haptic stuff, like there's one that uses pressure. I forget the name of the company right now, but they were they were using like liquid pressure to do things. And you have to wear a backpack all full of equipment to, to bring all these little flu, uh, basically pressure fluids out to try to make you do that feed, you know, to get the feedback. So this would be a, obviously a massive improvement over that. But I don't think I'm not convinced yet that the uh, at least from what my little bit experiences was that, that that was the way to go for for doing feedback. Now maybe they'll figure it all out or they'll figure out how to get those electrical signals. But you you kind of got to tune it up and you go up you kind of go up and down the scale. And maybe I didn't understand how to use it well enough. But I think it's a it's definitely a, at best an acquired taste. Okay, now we're gonna get into a whole different field of of displays. This is kind of at the high end and what I call true holograms and true light fields. Not to confuse with uh, things like HoloLens, which was uh, a major confusion factor in the industry. So these are things that are generating either a true holographic image or, or a true light field. One of the more interesting technologies I saw at the CES was, uh, I figured what they, I, I, I've had different ways of pronouncing it, be it SWAB or S-Wave. I've I've heard it done both ways, but they're building their own chip with a technology that was originally developed as a smart as a basically a, a memory technology. It's originally developed as a replacement for DRAMs. It didn't work out as a replacement for DRAMs, but they're they're looking at using this technology as a um, uh, the, basically the technology that that lost out to MRAM, uh, but they found it might be a good technology for making these these electrodes or the, the gratings that they produce here are smaller than wavelengths of light. They're sub-wavelength of light size elements. And because of that, they're able to generate, basically this is now able to generate a hologram. And the issue, some of the issues are, uh, people are wondering, you know, people are wondering about, but they actually use heat. They use heat to phase change, to use the phase change, which causes this electro, uh, the, their uh, grading to change. And they can set and reset it and, and, and generate with this real high resolution display a hologram. Now the questions are, can they really advance this technology? Can a small company advance a, te a technology like that? Like I say, it, it did not end up being the winner for DRAMs or for the replacement for DRAMs. That seems to be going in the MRAM route. So it's, I don't know if it has the driver behind it, but it's an interesting technology. They're able to produce uh, real holograms off of it. Um, and they're, they've got some really bright people working on it. It's spun out of, a, out of IMAC, which is a big European outfit, uh, this phase change material. Um, and they're, like I say, they're sub-visible, looking at elements that are 250 nanometers. So it's an interesting type of technology, but the question then becomes how long will it take them to develop and what will they what will they get? But they are producing real images. You can actually look and see things with it. This company VividQ out of out of uh, the uh, out of uh, I believe Cambridge, England. Um, their uh, VividQ has uh, is doing holographic imaging using amplitude modulation. So normally when people do holograms, when I hear about holograms, they're usually using phase modulation and they're using phase LCOS. They tend to use LCOS and they tend to use it in phase. Uh, Microsoft a few years ago even had a, 
had a thing with glasses using hol uh, true holograms, not to be confused with HoloLens, which there's no hologram anywhere in a HoloLens, not even the passive one, <laughs> uh, not even a holographic element anywhere in it. Uh, but they did have a true hologram at a um, at a, a cigarette presentation a few years back. Anyway, these guys are using amplitude modulation. They've demonstrated doing it with DLP, which I didn't realize you could do a hologram with it, but they actually were able to do a hologram with a DLP, although they've now moved on to using LCOS for their newer designs. Um, and so they're using a much more conventional L amplitude modulated technology, and they're doing algorithm development to develop and, and write holograms to that. And they're doing this so-called layer-based FFT approach. So they claim this will reduce the computational load. And they're kind of showing how this image kind of builds up from, from the FFT. You build up these wave fronts and you can do it to the eye. They're able to actually produce a, a hologram through a waveguide. I didn't realize that was possible either. But there, you can actually look into a waveguide and see a holographic, you know, three-dimensional image. Now, all these things are pretty crude. They're pretty low resolution. Not ready for prime time. This is all, and this is, uh, but um, one interesting thing they can do too, they sh actually had a demonstration. Now, it was a big box to get a little tiny image, but they were able to demonstrate that they could use a single white LED, not a laser beam, but a single white LED, illuminate a LCOS device, um, I, and they were able to generate uh, oh, yeah, they're using a 4K JVC LCOS, and they were able to produce a full-color image from a single white LED. So they're demonstrating that they're actually doing this holographic effect. So, But it's big and bulky and, and not ready for prime time. But it's just fascinating. I, I, it's interesting to see, like, these two companies, two small companies, both real high technology, having real high caliber that talent um, developing this technology. But the question I always have with a lot of these things is this is something a big company should be doing as part of a research and development operation. I wonder how these guys will keep getting enough money uh, to do this stuff over a long haul. But it's 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 amazing technology. It's undem beyond my knowledge. I'm an electrical engineer by profession. It's way beyond my, uh, as they say, pay grade to understand what it is they're doing. But I know they got really smart guys doing this. And then we have C Real, and they've been bouncing around here for a few years. I actually met C Real probably two or three years before they announced. They tracked me down <laughs> at uh, at CES one year, and I remember meeting with them. And being very impressed with what they had. Once again, it was very crude demo at this time, very big, bulky crude demo, but it was doing things I hadn't seen before. It's a they're doing what I call time sequential light fields. The the easiest way to do a light field, I say, is to take a really high resolution display and to break it into little tiny elements, basically use a lens array to generate a bunch of angles for each element. So you take maybe a dozen pixels and direct the light from that dozen pixels in different directions. You're creating a light field, a, a basically light from various angles. So if you move your eye or move your head, you get, you're trying to create as much of the different angles of light as possible. The problem you have when you do it spatially, that's a way of doing a spatial light field. The problem is when you do it spatially is you lose a lot of resolution. You also get kind of sub artifacts. The most famous one here is uh, what is it? Glass, looking glass. Looking glass technology has done this. And looking glass, my understanding is they're probably only doing it two dimensionally. Like when you they are only doing it yeah, two dimensionally. In, in, yeah. so I've had people debate whether that's even considered a light field. And if you don't, some people think if you don't go go at least two dimensionally, in some what you, you know you do it unless you do it somewhat two dimensionally, so you can go at least in all directions, that it, whether it's a light field. All these light fields will tend to have a sweet spot. Now, when you start talking near eye, well, you kind of know where the eye is because when you wear glasses. So you, you do get a, away from the sweet spot. You also don't need quite as many things because you're going to have less movement. You only have to worry about the movement of the eye. You don't have to worry about the movement of the head when you try to build a, a, a direct port. 
Um, so, and that goes for these other companies too. These guys who are uh, the guys we talked about previously, the S Wave and and VividQ, that they don't have to deal with that as well. Now, um, what uh, the difference with Serial? Serial is doing it time sequentially. They started with DLP. Another one of my many companies I've talked about, I said, it seems like everybody started, a lot of the companies that started with DLP have moved over to LCOS. You saw that with VividQ. Now you're seeing it with C-Real. Uh, C-Real uh, started with DLP, and they were using the time sequential thing. Now, you, you don't get something for nothing. The problem that you have is that as you, you're giving up color planes, because DLP Needs, uses that time sequential nature. They can do bit planes very quickly. Well, they change the color. So you got to sequence your colors and your color depth comes from bit planes. So they have a lot of different weighted depth planes. So they, each plane is done for different lengths of time and or different brightnesses of LEDs. But those planes represent a, some level of weighting of light. Well, if you're going to use that to do light fields, you give up color depth generally. So you trade color depth for light fields. Well, what C-Real has done is realize, well, you've got color domain. You, you start to, these are really some smart guys once again too. Uh, you start to realize that there are ways to call this and ways to figure out how, how to do this. So they do some tricky things to be able to get back some of the color that is lost. If you do it the most straightforward and simple way, you lose a lot of color. You can only have a few color levels. But they figured out ways over the time to figure out how to get back some of the color that's lost through that. The other thing is they've switched to using LCOS technology. They were another company. They were using DLP. Now all their new stuff is LCOS. Reason given is they can get more resolution at lower power. And, and, and also they can control it. I think one of the biggest reasons they switched is that with LCOS, they could get total control over the algorithm. TI has been in the past somewhat restrictive in the algorithms you can do. They don't they don't tend to help people doing strange algorithms with DLP. And so both the VividQs and the, the C reels, they're both wanting to do strange algorithms. And if they want to do strange algorithms, if they don't get a lot of help from TI, that they feel like they're better off going their own way. So anyway, C reels doing that. Another thing that that C reel does is they're doing, I call it the kiss off the temple method. Now, their current device, the, the things they currently show, have what I call the reverse butterfly. They have these two curved lenses that kind of come this way. And the reason why is if you have a flat mirror and you hit into it, you're going to kiss off and miss the eye. So you need some way to redirect the light coming from, say, the temple of glasses. You want to redirect them into the eye. Well, the other way to get that light redirected is to use a holographic element, a holographic uh, mirror. And what the hologram does is it makes the light behave, it behaves like it's not flat. It basically, what they can do is take this curve, what is a curved mirror and turn it into a flat, a flat piece of optics by using a hologram. So they're planning on doing what I call the kiss off the side. So they come from the temple, they come into this hologram and rather than having it bounce into your nose, the hologram is going to redirect it to bounce into your eye. And so C Real's been continuous to keep improving it. They claim that this is this here is a mock-up, but they're claiming they're going to be able to get their form factor down to something like they're going, they're moving from a form factor of this. They're expecting their next their next generation and what they're developing right now in their near future, they expect to have something kind of getting down to this form factor. What they claim what they claim to be able to get then is a claim to be able to do light fields so they're dealing with the virgins accommodation conflict you know if you close one eye you'll see focus i mean it, in other words it's definitely a true light field and they um they claim that they're able to get full resolution whereas spatially doing it you don't get there so see that, that they're doing it what we call time they're trying to get their time sequentially with a lot of different smarts and off the chart smart people working on this problem and they, like I say, they've developed their own LCOS. They've developed their own holographic elements for kissing into the eye. Hollow Eye is a company I've known for at least going on at least about 15 years. But Hollow Eye is kind of like the classic uh, phase LCOS guy. So they've been the, the traditionally selling phase LCOS. Now, 
um, one of the things that they, they've been uh, kind of the purveyor of that technology forever. Uh, in the past, I don't know what they do these days, but in the past, they would get LCOS devices for other people, but then they get the backplanes made by somebody doing amplitude modulation, and they turn around and put phase liquid crystal on it and get a kind of their customized design. So it's a sort of a semi-customized where they could use the controller from an analog guy and use their liquid crystal, and they would sell that as people wanting to do development with um, uh, light modulators. For, la for lasers. So they do laser modulation and whatnot. And they're kind of like one of the go-to companies for doing that. It's probably a little bit out of order here, but this co company at ARVRMR was Pentaray. And Pentaray was doing a near-eye light field display. As best I can tell, it's analogous to what uh, NVIDIA did many years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago now. But NVIDIA did a thing where they did a spatial. So this is, I believe, a spatial light field. But it is a light field. If you if you look through these things, look through the glasses. They have a they have some glasses there. You can see here, so they're like a little bird bath effect. But if you look through these things, you will see this thing change focus. It they they have this thing when you look through it. It's hard to see here, but as you look through it, you can watch this little dragon like thing move back and forward to the castle. It's made a little cardboard uh, pop up castle. And then you can see it move back and forth and you can see how the focus changes. So it's definitely a light field. I don't know how many different uh, little things they do, but it's pretty low resolution. It's not, not you know, this is the classic thing you have with spatial. Uh, when you do it spatially, you tend to give up resolution to get depth. You kind of trade to get these various depths. It does work to a degree, uh, but it it's somewhat limited in terms of resolution. Yeah, what I, what I think is interesting about all these companies, and I've seen C-Real relatively recently, but I've seen some of these demos also uh, over the years, is that the, the ultimate visual experience for a near-eye display is a holographic one, in which, ideally, the content is there and the eye chooses what to focus on, which is what these things are enabling, is that, like you would experience in the real world, your eye chooses where to focus the 3D. Of course, there's tons of trade-offs, right? It requires a lot more compute and uh, a lot of other, as you noted, some other challenges around the resolution or the color depth or some of the other elements. But from a natural visual experience perspective, this sort of vision of creating a holographic near-eye display is really where we hope to end up one day. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's true, but it, it's got all its, its, its drawbacks as well. Now, part of the advantage you have with eyes versus say light looking glass where you're trying to do it where you move your head all over the place or the company Leia that I talked about earlier where once again the same problem that you're you've got a um, a pro an issue of of your head can move around well now you've got a much you you have to deal with many many more different uh views you have to deal with before things break up because what happens is if you don't have enough views for the amount of motion you you get these sweet spots where you see it kind of it uh, uh, aliases where you'll you'll get in a sweet spot and then you get in another sweet spot and another sweet spot as you move your head around, or you'll see gaps. You'll see kind of like as your eye moves around, you'll see kind of gaps between things. You'll see things kind of look. You get artifacts because you're yep. you're not filling the gaps between them. The advantage you have with near eye, at least you know where where to look. Yeah. You know, you so with the, the yeah with the direct view like with you know some of the the direct view displays you described there you can get away with hundreds of views or maybe thousands of views it might very well be depending if you're actually doing just a single dimension or double dimension you might only need hundreds but probably need but thousands to create a good experience doing, i think 20 to, to 40 views or so yeah in that in that range but a great experience would be thousands of simultaneous yeah. views yeah but then you here need, in near eye you need that much higher resolution you need that much higher resolution of the display device right exactly here in near eye you can get away with less than a dozen and still have yeah. a really amazing experience yeah, and in theory, you might couple it. Like, I mean, there's this, and it's an interesting philosophical or thought experiment. Um, you know, one idea you could you can make the argument, and many people have. Well, what do you? One thing you do if you start tracking the eye and doing that really well, do you do all this other stuff like we see with Apple doing? 
Um, and you can imagine moving the optics, you know, go back to the um, Cambridge Mechatronics or somebody else doing some way of moving the optics around. So do you start tracking the eye and based on where the eye is and what you know about what the eye is doing, do you try to move, do you try to move in that dimension? In the case of a C reel, you might or might not couple in um, couple in the eye tracking to help you there too, because you can start calling or doing less, you have to do less and you could do more color planes. Mm -hmm. If say your eye is in a certain place, you say, well, I don't, I can, I can do more color or I can do stuff. So both of them have kind of, there's kind of a crossover. I kind of, it's not a, you got to kind of think of it as a spectrum of doing things where, okay, I've got a bag of tricks. And one of the tricks is to know where the eye is. If you know where the eye is, you can, you don't need to do so much. The downside of doing a pure hologram, like if you just totally ignore everything and just say, I'm going to do an infinite hologram, well, you got a lot of stuff. And this is the point I always make. I said, well, if I have a thousand by a thousand display to keep the numbers even easy, well, then I've got a million pixels. But if I want a thousand depths as well, then I got a thousand by a thousand by a thousand. Now that's that now we're talking big number. <laughs> you know, now we got a billion pixels. You know, the box, there's a billion elements in a thousand by a thousand by a thousand. So you got to kind of, and this is the problem with doing, just letting the eye pick. On the other hand, we know that probably you don't need that many depth levels. Although there's always this issue of, will you have problems as you step between things? Will you get the coverage? And it's, it's multidimensional because of all these different ways of doing it. Um as to how it breaks down, but what will cause it to break and can you avoid it? Um, and then, you know, like, but, but whatever you do that's going to be in depth is going to need more processing, more power. And by the way, C Real makes a big, and, and, and it may be true, but, you know, they're doing a lot of work into culling down the work, you know, to say, hey, we don't have to, you know, in theory, if I have 20 depths of something of a given resolution, then I have 20 times the work to do. But, as C Real says, you can you don't have you can pull that down. You maybe don't need to do all that work because you can, based on A, B, or C or D, you don't have to do this other work. You can get rid of work. So there's all those it's all those kind of philosophical arguments you can have all day mm -hmm. uh, about these things. Um, I'd say all of these are kind of far away from getting to mainstream use. I mean, most people I would say think that you know moving the lens. You know, cracking the eye and moving a lens is the way to start dealing with, say, Virgin's accommodation conflict. See, Real will take a big, big exception to that. Um, but, but, uh, and by the way, See, Real has, uh, I should say, I know they've been using some of their stuff. They claim in ophthalmic work because uh, this same technology, they say they can start doing vision correction. You know how when you go to the, the doctor and, and, and you, you see the eye charts at the doctor's office? And you look at the eye chart and he starts flipping dials around and, and flipping lenses over. And you say, does that look better? Does this look better? Does that? Well, with their technology, they can literally dial in the prescription into their stuff, they say. So they've got an, a kind of an adjunct business where they um, where they use this kind of technology for, for doing um, doing eyeglass work. Seems like a good good idea to me. And that might give them some revenue. One of the things I'm looking for is a, is a techno business person is saying, are there revenue streams that will sustain this technology as they develop it? Because, you know, it's hard to keep going back to the investors all the time, particularly in this day and age, um, keep going back to the investors to keep raising money. Um, 